Hey everyone, um, I'm Michael Sala. I work for the French Network and Information Security Agency. And this talk is about Landlock. Uh, I talked about Landlock last year, so I will not go through all details of the implementations, but I will focus my talk on the file system access control, which is pretty different than other LSM. The first part is a quick recap of why uh, Landlock uh, what it is and how it works. And the second part is dedicated to the file system part. Um, so this talk is about the eight series of the patch series, which was sent in uh, February. So there's no more new series for now, but uh, soon. And so let's start with the first part. Lanoc is first design, um, well, the thread is to mitigate bug, bug exploitation or backdoor in uh, applications. The so application may be server side or client side. So it may be, for example, a text editor or a web server. Here we want to protect the user of the application against unattended uh, accesses from these applications uh, to the user resources. So really, we want to slow down an, an attack. There's multiple important features provided by Landlock. Uh, the first one is to enable, well, to empower any developer of applications to be able to create a tailored security uh, policy for their needs. So some use cases. Um, for example, this may be used uh, to create a security model which fits best uh, your application. Uh, it's also, it is also useful um, to embed it, the security policy in your application. This way it is easier when you update your applications to update as well the security policy which is tied to the application. And then for example, uh, it may be useful uh, for the user to have only one configuration file which integrates um, well, the features of your application and some security properties too. Another one uh, important um, feature is uh, the ability to compose different access control on the same system. Uh, for example, on an end user um, computer, you may find a system administrator which wants to enforce some security policy. Also, one or multiple end users which may want to um, isolate their activities. And also, well, uh, the, application, the application, applications the user is using, which may want to sandbox the application to make them more secure, which is, for example, the case for some web browsers. Uh, it may also be useful for um, multiple um, cloud services, which may have multiple clients. Another important feature is the ability to update if it is uh, deemed necessary the, the uh, access control on the fly. This may be really useful, for example, to implement some Powerbox support on your application. So this is um, a Powerbox means an ability for a sandbox application to access resources outside of the sandbox. Uh, it may be seen as uh, for, an end, for an end user as a file picker, for example. Uh, you may find such a Powerbox in um, um, Mac OS, uh, Android, or even on Linux with uh, Flatpak or Snappy, uh, which may have other names like, like portals. And another example may be to um, update a security policy according to some external factors, like for example, um, user behavior or application behavior changes, or for example, uh, the time for example, office hours or uh, things like that. Let's first start with a simple demonstration. So here it is, um, we are still meeting a web server. So there is multiple paths which should be accessible in a read-only way and some which, are, um, which need to be accessible in a read and write way. For example, a slash public which contain uh, the most of the web files, slash etc, slash usr, and the slash tmp, which 
should be accessible in a read and write way. So here, I will not launch a web server, but instead we launch a shell, which is easier for the, the demonstration. So we are in the slash public directory. So you can see there's multiple files in here. Uh, not really web ones, but now there's one web file. Um, so I created the index.html file. And then I will launch a user applications, which is a sandboxer, well, um, well, a sandbox helper, uh, which take uh, multiple arguments. The first one is a list of paths, which should be accessible in a read only way. And the second one is a list of paths, which should be accessible in a read and write way. The user learn helper is here is called Lenok1, and we, it will launch a bin bash. Now we are in the sandbox process, so we are in the shell, but in the sandbox. And we still can list the files in the same directory. However, you may notice uh, that uh, there is some um, access which are denied. For example, the dot dot directory is denied, which is in fact the slash directory. And of course, we cannot write on the files, no. Um, but we still can go to the TMP directory, see what's inside, and create some files. And still, the search directory is not accessible. Well, we cannot do a stat on it. And we can uh, not go into it neither, or even list some other properties. So how does it work? In a nutshell, um, well, this diagram gives you the intuition uh, of how it works. Um, basically, it's pretty similar to how SecComp works, uh, how SecComp can apply a, secu a security policy. Um, the process, well, the first process which wants to sandbox itself, create a security policy and load it in the kernel. So this policy is a set of Lambda programs, which may be triggered for some specific action and can only restrict the process which um, loaded it. Well, that's the first uh, simple example. So if this process want to call the open syscall, access a file, um, this set of programs will um, take, a look, take a look at this request and allow or deny uh, the access. Lamlock is, um, well, made with multiple uh, important uh, part of the Linux kernel. So first one is the Linux security module framework, which provide um, a way to implement kernel code, which is dedicated to enforce um, security policy on user space. There's a lot of security hooks, more than 200. The second big part of Lunlock is the use of eBPF, so the extended backlay packet filter is an in-kernel virtual machine, which is dedicated to run, well, or interpret um, safely um, code by code in the kernel at runtime. So you can load it and unload it. It is really, it is um, um, used mainly uh, nowadays in uh, the network uh, part of the kernel, but also on the tracing part and some other projects are coming. Um, two really important properties about this virtual machine is that you can call dedicated functions in the kernel, which are dedicated for one type of program. And there's also a way to exchange information between two EBP programs and one EBP program with uh, user space process. So it is kind of new IPC. Here, Lona brings a set of hooks which are dedicated to um, a set of actions uh, uh, for specific kernel objects, for example, files. Uh, there's also a set of programs, which are in fact eBPF program, but dedicated to Landlock. This, this program can be stacked on uh, the Landlock hooks, and they may be interpreted, um, triggered, when their properties uh, ask 
to be triggered for a specific action. For example, read, write, um, or such action. So really here, Landlock adds a new layer of security. It is not meant to replace any LSM, but the goal is to uh, provide a new way to enforce um, and to secure your uh, application ecosystem. So it is on top, well, it should be used on top of um, other uh, security modules. A really important part of Runlock is the ability to be used uh, by unprivileged processes. So this is quite challenging because it is not the case for other processes, for other uh, LSM. Um, so there's two main challenges here. The first one is to protect resources from the applications which are sandboxed. So for this, a process which, which want to sandbox an application need to be able to p-trace this process. So this means that it is not a threat, threat if uh, this process uh, impersonate this process, if the requesting process impersonate the sandbox process. It is already allowed. But there's not only um, a need to protect user space, also the need to protect the kernel, and especially to prevent information leaks. Um, in fact, an EBPF, an EBPF program should not have access to information not otherwise accessible to the, pro to the process request requesting the sandboxing. Otherwise, we'll have a privilege escalation. Um, another important aspect is to avoid side channel, which may be, for example, um, avoided by only interpreted EBPF program after, well, on objects which are viewable by the process which requested the sandboxing. And of course, after other lesson. It is a kind of discretionary access control, but not really because it is implemented by uh, the developer. And another important aspect is the need to be able to account kernel resources which are used by these uh, new uh, access controls. So now let's uh, take a look at the second part, which is dedicated to the file system. So why and how the file system access control is different between Landlock and other LSM? First, um, there's two kinds of ways to enforce an access control uh, on the file system. First, you may use extended attributes, which is a way to tag to label files, but you may also only use path. So let's see the first way. The extended attributes, which are in each files, where, well, they are meta metadata, um, are really interesting because they're native to the kernel, uh, easily, be easily accessible, and efficient. But for Landlock, there's some drawbacks. Uh, first, well, it is not possible to use extended attributes to achieve composability. To, to implement different security policy and run them um, uh, side by side. Uh, because only one level per file, which means there is mainly one view of the file system by the kernel. For example, if you do multiple addings, uh, by months and use namespaces in container, for example, well, uh, the file which may have different paths will only have one inode, then only one label. For the in-privileged parts, um, well, we need to be able to account which uh, process sandbox, well, created uh, sandbox, uh, sandbox security policy. Um, also, if you want to use extended attributes, the file system you're using need to support this, which, me, which is not the case for every file system. And last but not least, if you want to label a file, you need to be able to write on this file system, which not be um, 
a good thing for Android users. You don't want a user to be able to write anything on the file system, of, you, of course. And for the dynamic parts, um, well, um, you may not want to impose a persistent labeling on the file system, but may prefer to um, label on the fly. About the file pass, so the other way to enforce an example on the kernel to create a, an LSM. Well, first it is really uh, interesting because it is the point of view of the user. So it really reflects the view of uh, what you want to uh, apply in a control on. But for unlock, there is some drawbacks. First, the, compos the composability. Um, well, for every file access, we need to remember how this file was accessed. Because you may use bind mounts, namespaces, and multiple hard links, well, there is multiple way to access a file, so multiple paths for a file. And for the inverted part, um, well, we need to deal with some um, underlying inode stuff, which may be tricky, like, for example, accessing a file with a partial path. For example, if you're using the open at syscall, uh, you get a file descriptor, and then you add a path, a rel rel uh, relative uh, file path. Uh, you may also use anonymous inodes, shoots, or nine spaces. So this all can be tricky to implement an access control with these constraints. Of course, there's a, the risk of leaking past information because, well, you cannot assume that the sandboxing uh, process is trusted. Uh, you don't want this process to be able to gather more information that than you should uh, normally have access to. For example, the death, uh, the death of um, a file or some underlying directory. So the idea with Unlock is to create a new eBPF map, which is called a NIDON map. So you may see a map as a hash map. So most of the time, it is um, an array with a key uh, and a value. With, well, multiple entries with key and values. The idea is here is to create a dedicated map um, to be able to identify an inode and um, tie an inode with an arbitrary value, like a label. Um, in practice, this map is filled with file descriptors, but in the map, the file descriptor uh, is not stored, only the inode, which is referenced by this file descriptor. This way, it is easy to fill the map but still, to fill a map, you need to first have access to this file, to the file descriptor. Um, because we deal with inode, it is quite efficient uh, to match an inode and to know if an access uh, match a known inode or not. And because it is an eBBF map, it can be updated by user space on the fly. If user space wants to keep the map open, Otherwise, it is easy to lock the map. And of course, um, well, it is usable by infrared processes because it is, again, an EBBF map feature. Um, so here, we achieve a way to identify an inode and not store any information on the file system. But still, we can account um, how much memory it takes, and well, uh, which process requested um, this memory. And as I said before, we are now able to tag any inodes, but this is not tagging the file system, only, only the, the files in the memory. Well, only the tagging only stay in memory. So now let's see another demonstration which is about updating um, an access on the fly, access control on the fly. So here, 
Um, there is two shell. Um, the first one uh, will be the one which will be sandboxed. And um, uh, at the bottom, you can see another shell, which, be, which will be used to update the sandbox on the fly. So first, here I use um, um, a file system, which is dedicated to BPF, to, be able to pin either a BPF program or a BPF map. But there is also a way to do it. And then I run almost the same sandbox, uh, sandboxer um, uh, we showed before, we see before. Um, so there's a list of files which are accessible in a read-only way, and a list of uh, paths which are accessible in a read and write way. But there's also a new path, a new arguments, uh, which, which say um, uh, where we should pin the BBF map. And then we run the shell. So now we are in sandbox, and you can see, well, uh, we can still access the files. But you also can see, well, some stuff here at not really great. Uh, because we, there's no mapping between UID and user. So do you know why we cannot see the root here and we only see UID 0? Because something's missing. In fact, well, um, it is the same for the prompt. There is no uh, username because two files are missing. First one is etc password and etc group. So, well, we can add them on the fly while still running the sandbox, in the sandbox. So here I call, um, I launch another helper, which sole purpose is to update um, landlock inode map. And here to add two paths. So now, without relaunching uh, the sandbox, well, the new access are uh, granted. But of course, if you want to have a nice uh, prompt, you need to uh, execute again a bash because it is um, a shell limitation. Okay, so let's see how it works. Um, there is two kind, two type of Landlock program. Uh, for now, the first one is dedicated to is dedicated to work through the file system, to work through directory, and the other type um, of uh, program is dedicated to allow or deny a specific action, a read or write. So the first one here is dedicated to go through the directories and identify a path. So you can see it as a state machine. This program, the FS work program, can then um, pass a state to another one, if it is uh, a file access. Here it is a file pick, which the first one is uh, triggered for open, chd, and get, get attribute, so ma mainly uh, read-only uh, accesses. And the other one, which is also an FS pick, can be chained uh, to the two previous, and this uh, third program will only be triggered for specific write actions. So let's see with an example. We have here at the bottom an eBPF map with, with a free uh, file, free anode, slash tc, slash public, and slash tmp, and an arbitrary value, which is kind of tag. So if we're working through slash public, slash web, slash index, slash dot html, well, the first file which will be seen by the BPF program will be the slash directory. So here, the FS work is first, uh, well, say the first invocation, interpretation of this program. But because the slash is not in the map, well, it is not known. So nothing, nothing happened. Then, when we go through the, the path, um, a slash public directory is seen, and this directory is present in the BBF map, so it match. And then the FS work program can then tag and change its states. Then it can pass its states 
through a variable well, in the BPF context called here cookie. So in this example, it is really a simple one, and it only um, said uh, the death of um, the path. Then there is a web directory. So the web, again, is not uh, referenced by the map, but the FS world knows that it was seen before. Well, uh, one of the files was seen before, so we are still in this file hierarchy. And then, finally, we reach the index.html, so the, the final target. And the FS pick can uh, look for the state of this um, chain of programs. And, well, if it is not zero, you can accept it. So again, it is a really simple example um, to illustrate um, the way to identify a file. And then this program can allow the access. So this way to identify a pass um, has many advantages for landlock. The first one is to be completely agnostic to shoot on all namespaces. Uh, there is no need for extra information, which are uh, not already available to the requester process. Um, it's easy to account how much resources are used. It is updatable on the fly. Do not rely on string matching, which may introduce a lot of um, uh, security issues. And, but we can still um, detect file hierarchies, but there's multiple, multiple ways to do it. Here was only an example, a simple one. And also, because it is fully in privilege and fully in user space, it is, it is quite easy to test um, this kind of security policies. But there's some drawbacks. Um, the first one, is well the main one is uh, that this pass identification rely on the way the kernel does uh, pass name lookup. So mainly, how does it resolve an a same link, the dot or the dot dot directories? And also, I needed to add a security block to name e data, which is used uh, to record uh, in which pass work we are. So there's some concern from some uh, upstream developers because um, this might rely too much on the current pass name lookup implementation, uh, which changes change multiple times, but this seems to be quite stable now. Um, so you can take a look at the, some headers in the uh, FS directory. And well, I think this logic may add change, but right now it is already viewable, visible to user space, and especially to um, discretionary access control and uh, other LSM, which may indirectly rely on the way the paths are resolved, and of course, the user-defined policies. So to wrap up, Landlock here is a user space hardening, uh, which is a programmatic way to create security policies and embed them in your applications. And it is designed to be used as, um, well, it is, um, it allows unprivileged processes to use it. This way you don't have to have uh, SOID uh, process um, binary and so on. So actually, uh, currently this, um, around uh, 2,000 uh, single line of code, which is not much. Um, there's ongoing patches, so you can follow them on the LKML or on my Twitter account. Um, so the main concern right now, I think, is um, the past name lookup. But one good thing which is coming, hopefully, is a way to stack multiple LSM. Which, we, which of course will be really useful for landlock because distro which implements, uh, well, which use SC Linux, Apamor, or other LSM will then be able to use unlock as well. 
So there's multiple future works, um, just to sit aside some of them. Um, the audit support, to be able to have any more uh, minimal audit support, but uh, this may be a bit tricky. Um, of course, to um, extend the access control to multiple uh, subsystem, like the network and IPC. Maybe to create real capabilities for Linux. And of course, uh, to have a decent library and tools to implement uh, security policy easily. And of course, uh, all this will not be possible with just, without uh, kernel developer reviews. So if you want to take a look at Linux, please do it. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'd be pleased to answer them now. Um, thanks. Uh, do you have a, a, an example of LL map that you could show us? Like oh. what, what the policy looks like, or is it a binary yeah. policy? Or? I can show you an example. So it is a C example. Is this one? Okay. Um, so I need to go quickly, but mainly the first union here is a way to describe some property of a landlock program. An EBPF program. First, I need to describe the type of this program, which is, for example, an FSP program. Then, some options. I will not go through uh, too much uh, deeply into that. The chainings, so which program uh, was chained before? Like we saw in the example, you may have multiple program chain. And some triggers, so you want this program to be um, triggered for append, create, and so on uh, actions. And the main program may lo look like this, but it is, uh, well, there's multiple lines um, which are in the update cookie uh, functions. But, well, you can take a look um, at the code. For example, on, well, take a look at uh, landlock.io and you'll, you'll see a code, the real code. But, well, um, so let's say this program is the one that allow or deny an access to write up to a, a write operation. Um, so it takes the value of the cookie, like we saw before in the chaining operation. Um, it updates the cookie, so if this if the cookie is zero, well it will stay zero except if the inode um, which is here in the the context argument is present in the BPF map. Otherwise uh, it will increase uh, the cookie. Well, it is a way to identify the file path. Then, uh, in this example, I mark, um, I add a mark to the cookie to say, okay, I saw this inode and it was uh, in the set of my inode which is allowed to be uh, accessible in a right way. And if this is the case, uh, well, I return. Uh, Hello. Otherwise, it is denied. So that's basically the the way right now you can write a policy. So this may not be convenient, but it is really a programmatic way to do it. But of course, uh, you may think about a more easier way to write a policy and still have some programmatic way to uh, well to do some um, tailored. Um, and custom security policy. Um, and then the following question to that, um, I, I seem to have interpreted that you said that you can't match on specificity of file descriptors, only of inodes, is, is that right? No, um, when I, well, um, so the map add a reference, well, a store references to inodes. So if a process want to access the, uh, a file descriptor, um, the well, landlock and the program uh, can see the underlying inode, so it will work. It is the intended goal. But what I was talking about is when you want to fill a map with inode references, just fill a map with a BPF syscall, and as argument, you use a file descriptor which reference 
the inode you want to put in the map. It is really a simple way, a unique way to fill a map. That's okay. it. So, so, you, so you just need a single reference to the inode. So it's right. Like opposite of what I asked. Okay. That, that yes. makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, just uh, one more question here. Uh, so other LSMs also use extended attributes. Does um, your use of them collide in any way? Uh, could you repeat, please? Other LSMs use extended attributes? Yeah. Does your use collide with those at all, or how, well, how do they work? No, well, I don't use extended attributes. Uh, I only use um, the blob for the strict inode. Uh, so for this, I, well, to be usable with other LSM, I need a way to stack and lock with AC Linux or, or uh, Smack, for example. So why now it is not possible? Um, well, in a clean way, uh, but with um, uh, LSM stacking patch series, it will be possible. So I hope it will be upstream soon. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the subsystem updates now. Thanks. Thank you.